six strokes. Holding water, so much you will know about dolphin kicks, flip turns, dives, and how to find an awesome coach. Hosted by Brian Welter and Tyler Kearns. Holding water is where competitive swimming is learned. Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back to the show. I uh oh there's Tyler. Welcome back to the show. We uh this is uh what week nine, week ten? Yeah. Something like that. It's uh we're excited to have a great guest today. We've had him on once before and did a great job. Uh you know, it's great to have him back. We actually went over last time because we couldn't stop talking about swimming, so we're looking forward to to getting into it a little bit this week with uh, long axis strokes and what's going on with that. Um, so without further ado, we'll bring in our guest, Russell Mark. What's going on, Russell? Hey, all. How are we doing? Good to be here. Good to see you guys. See you Good again. to have you back, man. We had a great time last time. I think that was one of our most popular shows, and uh, we got a lot of positive feedback about everything. So uh, we're excited to have you back again. Awesome. Uh, I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> What's been going yeah. on? What you been up to? Oh man, just same old as last time. I mean, things don't really change much these days, right? Uh, you know, just trying to spend. I'm still in Colorado, um, and just trying to spend time outside, and, and still trying to stay engaged with our athletes and coaches, and swimming across the country. You uh, you have a pretty good sense that most most everybody national team wise is is back in and moving on regular schedule again. Yeah, I, I would say most people are still not back to normal. Obviously, if you're based at a university, you might have issues getting into the facility, depending on what's going on at that university. Um, and, you know, because of limited gathering sizes, people are still um, probably not doing a whole lot of long course. So I would say people are training, but with some regularity, but definitely not in their optimal schedule. Yeah. Brian, what about you guys? I know you guys over there in Lakeside have, have been moving in practice and now you're what? And had a meet this weekend? First first big one? Um, yeah, we had, well, it's a second meet, but um, we expanded it out to 120 athletes uh, per session. We ran two sessions, so we ran it for the top 240 kids. Uh, we, we broke it up, so we had like, if you had three double B times for 10 and under, you got to swim in it. If you had one A time as an 11 and 12, you got to swim in it. If you had, I don't know, national prep and national, we let everybody from those groups. I don't know. So it kind of broke out like that. Um, and it was, it was good. We had about 110 kids in the girls' session and about 100 and right at 100 in the boys' session. Um, so, you know, it went well. Kids did a good job, kept their masks on, stayed socially distanced for the most part. The girls were way better about it than the guys. Um, but, you know, we had some good swims. We had some – some solid swims. It was the second meet, so it actually kind of felt like a swim meet. The first one felt more like a science experiment or something. You know, it was it was very like I don't know, just contained. I guess you know, you got masks and you got everybody spread out and everybody's yelling at everybody to stay spread out. This one was a little bit more relaxed because we kind of knew the routine. So um, I thought it went it went pretty well. I mean, so but we're back and we're back training. We're doing a pretty good job. Um, you know, in the pool, uh, we still like I'm running seven or six practices a week and I'm getting the same amount of time that I was getting in eight. So we're doing a little more volume each practice, but we're doing about the same per week. So that's been one of the challenges of COVID. Um, the biggest challenge I see Joe put on there. What are some of the challenges we had at our first meet? The biggest challenge we had at our first meet was figuring out the the flow of traffic and how to keep the kids from, from being all on top of each other. Um, and once we figured that out, then it went pretty well. So uh, that was kind of our big, our big step. What about you guys, Tyler? Man, I think if you can get through the sanctioning process right now to get a meet sanctioned, you're, you're going to be pretty prepared to run the thing once it actually comes time to run the meet, because um, it is, I know coaches that are out there that are trying to sanction meets right now, um, I just went through it for ours coming up in a couple weeks, uh, and it's it's definitely challenging. But all right, Russ, we want to we want to jump in. Sorry, we've been chatting, and everybody's here for you, not for us. So, uh, yeah, I mean, all that's serious, real. Right all that's very real. So I appreciate you guys being able to talk about that stuff too. It is. Uh, it's certainly it's certainly 
something I never imagined in 2019 telling myself that this would have been the case. So, um, but we came, everybody come today to, to listen and chat about long axis strokes. Um, so, um, you know, want to talk freestyle and backstroke for coaches out there. If you guys have questions during the show, we want to make this interactive. So if you have something for Russell that even if it's a specific question, we'd love to have the opportunity to address it uh, during the show. So uh, feel free, click on the video and uh, you can you can put in a comment and, and we'll address it as soon as we can. Um, all right. So, Russell, long axis strokes. Um, we'll just you want to start with freestyle or backstroke? You pick. I mean, freestyle is always the easy starter and yeah. a lot of common vocabulary. So we can so, start with that. So what are you looking for in uh, in freestyle? And you go through, uh, you know, kind of on your own body position, leg drive. What are you looking for in the arm stroke? Yeah. I mean, if you want to start with body position and head position, yeah, just trying to keep everything at the surface. Um, I'm going to keep this really simple because everyone knows that I could talk for each stroke probably for an hour plus. So we're um, trying to keep everything at the service, head position. Um, I'm okay with things being tilted forward. I would rather see the neck tilted forward than the head lifted up. I think those are two different things. Um, and I think that slight head tilt um, can help what everybody wants, which is a great catch. And with that catch, what I'm looking for is, yeah, a bent elbow. Um, basically, so if you're trying to move water, move this way, you're trying to push water back. So trying to get a good catch, um, what I'm looking for specifically to do that is from a front view, looking for what I call the power triangle. So if I'm swimming towards you, basically having your hand underneath your shoulder and your elbow popped out to the side and this basically forming this, the, the shape of a triangle with your elbow, shoulder, and hand, and that position gives you the catch um kind of along with that uh looking for um i would say an appropriate amount of rotation too many folks i think teaching and trying to do too much rotation and the two if you're looking for a catch and a rotation and a big rotation the two directly conflict so those are the those are the big things i would say with the arm stroke and the rotation uh but then with the kick just looking for full motions to so very full kick underwater. I have rarely seen kicks that are too deep um, among the elite level. Um, you know, and just looking for full extensions underwater. I'm, I'm, it all starts with a knee bend too. And I know I mean, we can talk so much about all this stuff, um, but the knee bend definitely is what initiates the kick. And if you want to, if you have issues with people bicycle kicking, um, you know, or that kind of that kick that we all know isn't right like this. The issue isn't the knee bend. It's the fact that the feet don't follow through downward. And that is the difference between somebody's bicycle kicking and somebody who's doing a, a really effective, good kick. So um, I'll, I'll leave it. I'll start with that. And obviously we can dive into many other details, but those are kind of the basics I'm looking for. Brian, go ahead. I saw you, mute, you, you unmuted first. Go ahead. Um, so I guess my question is, uh, you're talking about rotation and catch and all of that. Um, one of the things that I got away from, I don't know, back when I was in Nashville, um, was having, having very much hip rotation. I always talk more about like having flatter hips, like we're kicking on a board and then rotating from basically the belly button up. Um, trying to use that rotation through your core and through your shoulders, not so much through your hips. Um, you know, am I, am I off base or on base or what, 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 what do you think? Uh, you're absolutely right on. I mean, I, you know, the first kind of place I, I, I was kind of leaning towards this probably a decade or so ago. And then I heard Mike bottom and I heard, um, I think it was Brett Hawk both talk about that at, uh, when they talk about freestyle. And obviously those are sprinters and you might get a little bit more hip rotation out of a distance server. But the thing is that with, I totally agree. So it's more from the shoulders and the torso than it is from the hips. When you are rotating the hips a lot, that is when you end up with an athlete that their legs are crossing and that their legs are, and feet are hitting each other because their leg rotation can't keep up with their body rotation. So it just drags behind. And that's when you have 
that motion going. So yeah, trying to have stable hips to go along with good, ex- you know, the, the rotation is really a product of you extending and reaching forward. It's not a, it's not a product of purposely trying to be, go from one side to the other. And I think that's an important distinction, but Brian, you're absolutely right on. So one of the things that we talk about with that, just verbiage, you know, we were getting into verbiage. One of the things we talk about, or I talk about, I don't know if we talk about it, is talking about having a propulsive kick like you're kicking on a board versus a balance kick that tries to keep you in line. Because um, I, I, I term that that twisting kick as like a balance kick. Because all it's trying to do is keep them up on the surface of the water. It's not actually prop- propelling them forward, best I can tell. Um, so, yeah, Brian, do you guys do you do anything on like a stick or anything like that, like working on that front end of, of that? Um, and you, you know, I have um, actually. I kind of stole. Uh, I've been playing with a new one lately because I kind of stole it from. I think we stole it from Ben. The middle finger entry thing. I don't know if you remember that, Tyler, the middle finger entry. So I don't know how Ben does it. I have no idea. But the middle finger entry idea sparked me because my thought was if we can get the the, the tip of the the middle finger nail into the water when we extend, then we're going to be in the right position to go into the catch. And if we extend into the catch, then we're going to be in the right position there. So we've been doing middle finger finger entry, and we do it with a two-second pause, and we do it with a one-second pause, and then we do it swim. So we'll go two seconds where we're extended out like that, and then one second where we're extended out, and then we'll go into a swim. So we started doing some of that. Um, I have used sticks in the past. Um, Mitch Ivey, uh, I stole from Mitch, and he probably doesn't even know who I am. But um, when I was watching him when he was in Gainesville, he used to do, um, with, with all those girls he had at Florida, he used to do 1050s on 45 or 50 with fins on with a stick breathing to both sides. So they breathed every single stroke and um, they did it every day. Like every time I was there around him, I saw him do it. And um, we did that for a while. I thought it helped, but um, I I, I don't use a lot of equipment. I'm pretty minimalist when it comes to that stuff. Um, Just because on the opposite end, I, I use a lot of equipment like every day, like we use a snorkel almost every single day in freestyle. I know, Brian, you guys don't use them a lot. Uh, and Russell, you talked about um, talked about the head position, maybe a little bit more forward than people used to really try to pack the neck and pull everything back. And I felt like that really limited your shoulders and, and put you in a very stiff, unathletic position. So that's part of the reason, you know, we try to get the snorkel so that, you know, like Mark said, we're trying to really engage the lad in that catch and we're trying to to sweep that hand through. So what are things that you hear coaches or or our top end athletes talk about how they key in, maybe what that vocabulary is for them, ways that they really think about the importance or engaging their catch? Yeah, I would say. I don't know, you know, the language I use um, is definitely just rotating forward and trying to keep your shoulder next to your face. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of it is, you know, everyone across the country uses different vocabulary. Everyone has a different perspective on looking at it from, all, you know, across our best. And so we're talking about like getting your fingertips down, getting your elbow up. Everyone knows what to look for. Um, and most of our elite athletes, naturally i would say not naturally but just have always not had a good catch throughout their entire career so i'm not necessarily coaching them up on that but a lot of it happens a lot of that time when i'm coaching them up is let's say when they're breathing and their catch isn't as strong versus when they're not breathing so just trying to remind them and point out to them what those differences are when they what 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 their body position and what their rotation is when they're breathing that prevents them from getting that catch uh, and then talking about, hey, let's make that more like when you're not breathing. And that has to do with trying to keep your shoulder, inst- you know, when you t- if you're breathing to the right, trying to keep that left shoulder still a little bit higher, trying to turn more from the neck instead of really driving your whole body into it. Again, it comes down to minimizing that rotation on the breath in order to get that, um, in order to get that good catch on your, on your non-breathing arm. Do you see, uh, do you see a lot of athletes – uh, with underwater video, when they take that breath, that that hand kind of trail across the face a little bit, or the fingertips kind of come towards that the side that they're breathing. That's something I know age group wise that I try to really stress to them is once the fingertips get extended and forward, 
even during that breath, they're they're pointing down and not across to to sweep underneath. Because like Brian said with the kick, it's just it's a bad balance to just try to keep yourself up on the surface, right? Absolutely. I see both things. You know, I see people come across their body. I see people take the breath and like the hand will sweep out as a balance to try, you know, if their head comes out of line when they take that breath too, or their hand just kind of like, because they're over rotating and really like just leaning into that breath so much that hand goes down. So basically, like you said, like, it's totally right. Like you want to keep, try to keep that hand extended forward and in a good set position before you engage that catch instead of sweeping in really balancing out to keep you afloat or to just press down to kind of lift your head up. So a lot of it, again, is like stems from what your breathing mechanics are and what you're trying to do there. So, um, okay. So I, yeah, this is kind of along the same lines, but so when you're looking at distance kids versus sprint kids versus middle distance kids, how much of a difference do you see in the straighter arm versus the really high elbow, you know, versus kind of somewhere in the middle there. Like what, I mean, I know like when David was at Auburn, he used to, you know, all those, all him and Brett both, both basically had those guys doing almost a straight arm pull because they were only swimming the 50 short course yards and they only had to take like eight strokes total or something. And they were able to pull it off because they were powerful and strong enough. So I guess my question is, is like, how do you see the comparison when you're looking at these national team athletes, when you, you look at, you know, Bobby Fink versus Nathan Adrian, um, you know, cause Bobby definitely has a lot of rotation. I mean, and Nathan, not yeah. as much. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, I will say that, um, you know, across the national team, whether you're a sprinter, mid distance or distance, you are, like every athlete is still trying to catch good water up front and trying to catch more water up front than and tr always trying to work on that. So I do think that that is a priority, whether you're Nathan Adrian or you're Bobby Fink and, and that doesn't change. So, you know, what you get with the sprinters is they do tend to, ha you know, I talk about that power triangle, you know, the distance swimmers will be more bent and maybe a little bit wider and you're going to have the sprinters naturally because they're entering and just driving straight into that catch. You're going to see that be a, a, a lot straighter in their arms. So you're going to see instead of this kind of position, you're going to be more extended downward and forward. And so, you know, I do think that there is just the balance that you're trying to strike when it comes to um, what you're, how much water you're trying to catch, how quickly you're getting into the catch but ultimately still trying to catch water. I hope that uh, answers your question. So, yeah. Um, go I, ahead. Uh, yeah. So on the, continuing down that line. So, you know, we're talking age group, age group swimming and comparing that, how we apply that to what we're trying to do with the kids to develop that. Um, you know, I guess my question is, is so if you've got a kid that's not getting into the catch well with a real high elbow, um, you know, how do you feel about the idea of having them pull deeper and have a straighter arm or if it's the other way around and they're really, really deep, but they're getting pretty good power and they're getting into the catch, you know, I guess where, 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 where is that balance and how do you, if you're looking at it, how do you see that progression from nine years old up to 25 years old, you know, and, and where, where do we make those changes? I guess, um, yeah, I, I, you know, from an age group perspective, I would say that, you know, most or all age group coaches that I talk to are trying to teach those good catch mechanics. And then as they get older, as they build in more strength, as they, you know, can can have a deeper hand in the water because they're stronger, that I think you kind of you go from there. So you'll get less of a catch or be have a little bit more straighter arm as you get older and stronger. But I do think, you know, from a foundational standpoint, you're trying to teach a very, um, I would say, a very good catch, catch mechanics, you know, looking from this, look, that looks very similar to this, you know, and yeah. whereas if you're, I accidentally muted, uh, <laughs> if you're, if you're a sprinter, I mean, you, as you get older, you'll probably be a little bit deeper and probably straighter. And then, you know, if you're going to slow down your tempo and really try to get into it and then get a, 
you know, be a, a distance swimmer, you might be a little bit wider and out here. So it just really depends if, if you're pulling, you know, that was probably more of a catch up stroke to be way out here because you're leaning into it and then you'd be flatter when you get this catch because your hand is entering. So you'd be flatter in your rotation. And so you'd be wider on this arm and getting a really defined catch. Um, but your tempo is just going to be a lot slower in that time. So uh, the, the relationship between the rotation and the catch is so key and it's, it is complex. Um, and that's why it's so hard to refer to having a good catch and correcting that without understanding where your shoulders are at that point. So Russell, you're going to you catch the most important thing about freestyle stroke itself. Is that fair? Yeah, that's what I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you just got to have a good, strong front end, right? You have to have a good, strong front end. I know Mark um, from Santa Clara was very big on that a few weeks back when we talked about it. What, Brian, what are ways that, that you try to work on teaching that to, to age groupers that maybe somebody may be able to take back and use? For me, I like to talk about, I think it all starts with reaching out front, good distance per stroke, making sure I talk about when I'm, especially when I'm teaching distance per stroke, like skating that hand forward. Um, and I really liked the way Megan put it a few weeks back on the show when she talked about once the hand is there, you've got to gather water kind of in that space, in that forearm. And then you've once you gather water, you've got to move yourself into that space. You've got to go forward. And the way you do that is by, you know, whether you talk about anchoring the hand or whether you talk about, um, you know, moving your hand through the water. Um, to me, I've always liked to, to teach the athletes that wherever your hand goes in, it's going to come out in a relatively similar place. You're just moving your body past that point. So they really get that feeling of, of moving themselves forward during the catch. But Brian, what are ways that you try to teach that to your athletes? So well, the one of the things, well, just to, to throw it out there, I don't use it that often anymore, but one of my buddies that I used to coach with used to talk about over the barrel. And the idea was if you had a bunch of barrels set up, you reach out, you grab over that barrel and then you reach out to the next barrel. And that's the same idea as you're talking about where your hand goes in and your hand comes out at the same spot that it goes in because your body moves past it. So, and I think the over the barrel concept gets the elbow up. So I, I've used that in the past. I haven't used it in a while. I just was reminded of it when you were talking. But one of the things that we spent a lot of time talking about is we want to come in a little bit early and we want to rotate into the front of the stroke as we're rotating through the back of the stroke. So we spend a lot of time talking about the connection and the shoulder and the shoulder harness. Basically, you want to be connected through your shoulders and you want to use the rotation through your trunk to get anchored and then use the rotation to finish the stroke. So we try to eliminate the whole concept of pulling and use more about anchoring and rotating. Um, that's that's kind of how we talk about it. The biggest, I don't spend a lot of time on semantics and in general. So I just per pretty much want them to get their fingertips down and their elbow up. So fingertips towards the bottom and elbow up. And if we're in that position, I feel like we're in a good spot. And we talk a lot about, you were talking about sweeping across. If your fingertips are pointed to the side, you're you're in a bad position. We got to get rid of that. It's got to be elbowed. It's got to be fingertips down because if we get to this point or to this point, we're, we're not efficiently moving. Um, now, having said that, my best age group boy that I've had since I've been here does a sort of a Bobby Fink gallop type of stroke. And he's so strong that he can have his fingertips on his left side because he breathes this way. He can have his fingertips pointed to the side and still generate enough power with that rotation to get out after it. So I think it kind of depends on the kid, but that that's kind of the stuff we focus on. Um, and like I said, we do spend a lot of time talking about keeping the hips pretty much as flat as you can be and keeping keeping the you know the butt muscles engaged and the core muscles engaged. That way your hips are anchored. You're not just like, you're not just trying to keep them flat. You're trying to keep them tight and keep them in line with your body line. So that, that's pretty much what we talk about. Um, and so, like I said, I do modify it depending on the kid. It just depends on what kind of strokes they have. I think that's the biggest thing for, for everybody out there is like, 
we're telling you the ways that, that we like to communicate it with ours, but that is by no means the answer for everybody. There's a, a million different ways to do this. And, you know, really, I think ultimately you've got to coach to that kid's strengths and educate that kid on their weaknesses, try to, um, you know, level up on every, all of those things that they're trying to do. But so if the catch is number one, Russell, um, to me, I've always been a huge proponent for age group kids to be able to kick fast. Um, we don't do a ton of slow kicking just because honestly, I think it's a waste of time um, to just kick slow for long periods of time. We don't do a lot of social kicking and that stuff. I know people do, um, but we like to try to kick really fast and a lot of flutter kick, especially early in the year. Uh, we talk about earning your kick and being able to do that. So, um, you know, is that something you see from our top athletes, how, uh, a, a predominantly really strong kick? And, oh, and with a board or without a board. You know, I think we see both. Um, I think, uh, you know, most of it is with the board. Um, you know, a lot of our best athletes are kicking with the board and with the snorkel. Um, that way they can keep their head in line a little bit better then have their head up and then they have their hips a little bit lower. Um, and I like that too. I think that's great. Uh, I would say that, you know, for probably going back for the last 10, 15 years, since I've been really watching the national team, our national team in swimming could easily be very much our national team in kicking too. So yes, like our best kickers are our best swimmers. And I think that there is a, a really strong correlation between the two skills and 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 lend to your point that the fast kicking is really important. So what what how many athletes do you see doing the old school two beat kick? Because um, I I look at even our milers and I feel like now even our milers they're steady Eddie the entire time they're kicking fast the whole the whole swim. Yeah, I think most people are trying to keep a steady kick happening the whole time. So there are very few two beat kickers, and you know I mean. <laughs> You go even in in our open water athletes. I mean, someone like Ashley Twitchell um, and Haley Anderson aren't using their legs as much, but they can. Like when it comes down to the last, you know, eight hundred thousand meters of that ten k, they know how to use their legs. And I think, you know, to do that at the last ten percent of your, you know, of your two hour swim, uh, you have to train that. And so every athlete is working on their kick and working on getting it better. And that's, you know, just chatting with some of our national team athletes, like who's maybe not known for their kick uh, just to let this month. I know that that's something that they've been working on. So how many, like I, I'm going to use our guys as an example, Alex Zettel um, is maybe the worst freestyle kicker on a board that I've ever seen. And he is definitely the second worst kicker maybe the worst kicker i think at the university of texas um but he's got an ability like you're saying to be able to go to the legs at the end of a race and he's got an ability to be able to kick during a race but you put him on a board and he looks like he's drowning so i mean what what you know it doesn't make sense to me but what are your thoughts on you know those kind of kids and you, what do you do with that? Do you keep hammering away with a board and watch him go 145s, or do you, or do you move on and just say kick without a board, put a snorkel on, or you know, what? I mean, is kicking with a board important? I guess. I mean, that's the first yeah. thing. I'd be curious, you know, what is happening if what is happening when he's on a board with his hips and uh, if his if his hips are low and and therefore putting it into just a different position than he would do when he swims. Um, I don't think kicking with the board is necessarily that important. I, you know, mechanically and physically, I think that is more definitely just a, a change of, you know, it's a tool that people use and it's a little bit easier to manage for an athlete maybe. And that I think it's a way to mix things up. I don't think with the board is absolutely necessary, but obviously people appreciate it. And obviously you can't social kick. And I know you mentioned Tyler, like people aren't social kick. Like social kick is not really a physical training um methodology it's yeah. it's really just i see people use it as a way to warm down and just keep their blood flowing um so it's not really a kick training tool as much as just a way to keep their their body moving but um yeah a board is just really a tool to, to that you can use to mix things up all right there's another question about in there about uh about a tool potentially for kicking shoes um i know that's when i was an age group swimmer we had a coach that 
believed in it. We did it occasionally. We put old tennis shoes on and and kick, and it was so much fun. Um, I, you know, not at all. Um, but you know, what are your thoughts on that? Man, I've seen programs that are, are I've seen great programs use it a lot, um, but not that many anymore. I think a lot of it is like athlete fatigue of it. Um, but you know, I think Frank Bush when he was at Arizona used shoes a ton. Uh, I know, I, I think Amanda Weir did a lot of shoe kicking or Swim Atlanta used it a bunch. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but I do know that there are programs that have used it. I, I think, yeah, I mean, you just have to balance it out. I, there are programs now that are just using, um, that do some kicking with, um, gosh, now the name is like the, the next, the, drag socks. the drag socks. Yes. Um, so people kicking with that, I think accomplishes a lot of the same thing and maybe um, easier to put around your equipment bag than a pair of shoes. Uh, so I think that might accomplish the same thing, basically forcing you to use your entire leg as opposed to just trying to feel water with your feet. And similar to like if you were swimming with this and trying to use your whole arm uh, as a propulsive mechanism rather than just using your hands and relying on your hands. Russell, have you, uh, are you familiar with weighted fins at all? Not really. Haven't seen that used it much. Do you use it? Uh, yeah, I'm a pretty big proponent. I stole it from Randy. Um, it's basically what it sounds like. It's weighted fins. You put scuba weights on fins and you go. And um, it's it's pretty amazing the level of fitness that you'll get. Um, and uh, it's also pretty amazing the amount of rest you have to give them off of weighted fins to get them back. It'll take you a solid six weeks to get them back. So I feel like if it's taken six weeks to get us back, we're pretty broken down and we're doing some work. So I, I feel like it's a good thing. But uh, and I was just curious if you'd seen it. I tried drag socks. I couldn't get into it. Didn't work for me. But I don't like snorkels either. So what do I know? Yeah, I think the thing with drag socks, just like fins, any kind of fins, is like the important thing about a kick is having the full motion, like having – a kick that finishes all the way ex with a full extension downward and with drag socks and with fins, I think it's pretty easy to not follow through on that motion. So just still having that, um, and you can use drag socks with fins too. Um, I've done yeah, that actually. I don't hate that. Yeah. And it's, I think, you know, just making sure that the athlete knows like, cause it's so easy, especially with fins to just like flick your foot and you're moving forward, but you're not getting the full motion. Cause that's actually harder with fins. Um, so just trying to make sure you get that full mechanic down that is accurate to a good kick. So have you done anything looking at ankle flexibility, like when it comes to these kids that are fantastic kickers versus kids that are terrible kickers versus somewhere in the middle? I mean, ha has anybody looked that you're aware of looked at, you know, the difference in the ankle flexion, being able to point your toes and, you know, all that. I mean, I know we've talked about that hyperextension of the knee, you know, like Michael and Ryan both have where they can just like almost stand backwards, you know, at their legs, they're like giraffes, their legs bend the wrong way. Um, what, what, what have you, what do you, what do you got on that? I mean, yeah, absolutely. You know, any, in, any good range of motion is a help for swimming. So whether it's, you have your hyperextensive knees or you have good, ankle flexibility, that is just a bonus for, for helping you through the, the motion that you're already doing. So I, I do think, you know, while hyperextended knees is not something you can really work on, but ankle flexibility <laughs> might be something you can work on and, and something you can work on safely. So I do think that that's something that, um, that is worth, you know, spending some time on, uh, especially at a younger age where you're, um, you know, an athlete and a, and a young person's body is a little bit more malleable. So uh, tell me what you think about this idea. I haven't done it in a long time, but I did it a long time ago in Nashville. Um, what do you think about the idea of having age group kids when they're young kick with fins against the wall and have bigger kicks? That way they have to work on that. It, it, instead of it being a kicking exercise, it's more of an ankle flexibility exercise. Does that make sense? Sure. I love all this stuff that you guys come up with <laughs> or that you guys tell me about and you guys have tried. Like, I think exactly like what is important is you're mentioning an exercise and then you have an understanding of what you're trying to do 
and uh, there's a point to it. And I think that's a great one. Yeah, Brian, one of the things I like, I, I like to go straight from a vertical flutter where they have to really focus on kicking in both directions. They just do a burst of a vertical flutter and then push off the wall and go right into a fast flutter kick, trying to create that same tempo, that same undulation of the leg going up and down or articulate however you want to um, to describe it. But just movement in both directions, I think, is really important to, to encourage for age group guys. And you know, I know Amber asked a question earlier about breaststrokers. I've always had breaststrokers who have great ankle flexibility, but maybe aren't really good freestyle kickers because they finish that kick with that toe pointed out instead of turned in. So, I mean, for me, I like I like a vertical kick because you can't really turn that toe out vertically or you're going to see them really bounce up and down. So, Amber, that's one that I've used in the past for just put their hands across their chest and kick straight I up. I think the, the breaststrokers – the real breaststrokers have such a great feel on the bottom of their feet when it comes to understanding how to push water that they want to push water rather than kick water like this. And so, I mean, you have to get them to point their toes. I mean, I have a breaststroker right now and he is just a disaster in long axis strokes because he, he will not keep his hips in place because he's trying to do this bicycle push kick all the time. I mean, and it's just, it's, it's, you know, I keep telling them, I'm like, until you change this, it's not going to, you're never going to get there. Like you can't do this. This is, you're so out of whack. And, uh, but he, he feels that water so well with his breaststroke kick that that's what he wants to do. He feels like it's making him faster. And I've had a number, I don't know if you remember Alex Goss, but Alex Goss was the same way. I couldn't break that kid of that. I mean, He's a 53, I think, on a breaststroker at Yale. And, you know, but he, I mean, he'd kick himself in the leg so bad he'd end up with bruises. You know, <laughs> I'm like, dude, stop. Just put, keep normal. Um, so I don't know. Um, right, we're, at, we're at 40 minutes. So we got to, we got to go to backstroke or we're going yeah, to say we got to go to backstroke. Yeah. Backstroke uh, guys out there that have been waiting around to talk about backstroke. Uh, so Russell, what's what's important for backstroke? What are the what are the key things? I have a feeling it's going to sound a lot like freestyle. <laughs> there you go, and that's why we started freestyle: is having a good catch and then an appropriate amount of rotation, which in many ways I think is a little bit less than what people think. Just like in freestyle, so it is. I think that's why it's so good to start with freestyle because we are going to. I mean, most people can understand and relate to that, and then going to backstroke is just an extension of that, and a lot of the same. So backstroke catch basically having the arm out to the side and you are, where's my hand? So you're basically fingertips are pointing the side instead of pointing down towards the body, keeping it. Uh, yeah. You're keeping it, you're pushing it back this way. And basically from the moment your hand enters, you're hitting the catch. Your hand is never pointing down towards the bottom and you're hitting the catch. You're pushing water, probably get towards your hips. And then it comes more towards a downward finish. Um, and your hands will finish below your hips. But really that important part is that first half of the, of the stroke where your hands, are put, your hands are to the side of your body, your palms are facing towards your feet, your fingertips are facing towards the side of the pool. And then in terms of rotation, yeah, it's similar. Like you're, you're more on your back than you're on your side. You're not getting your shoulder um, all the way up. You're not getting your shoulder underneath your chin in, your, in the rotation. The best backstrokers keep their shoulder next to their face and next to their chin and cheek, and that's how they recover. Uh, and then, and then equal amount of rotation underwater. So you're not, since you're not pulling deep, you're not reaching behind you. Your arm is to the side. You're looking at, yeah, your arm is more to the side than it is um, than it is behind you. And so you have your one arm to the side. You have your one arm in front of, like, kind of lined up. Uh, like straight neck above your shoulder and that shoulder's next to the face. And that's kind of where the motion goes. It's like, like this. Um, so it's not a full windmill motion, obviously, because underwater your arm is more to the side. So that's kind of where I would put the basis in backstroke. So one of the things that, uh, and I'll thank in advance, because one of the things I picked up when I was at age group summit this past year from your talk was um, you talked about the backstroke catch basically being the freestyle catch just on your back. And you talked about it like, okay, it's freestyle catches here. Well, backstroke catches the same thing. It's just here. 
And, and I thought that was really like, that blew my mind. Um, I had never thought about it that way. And I think that the way that I thought about it was reaching back to catch, to pull through. And I think that idea of the freestyle catch keeps the shoulder in the right spot. And I, I know a couple of years back, I did a, I listened to one of your try. It was probably at age group summit as well. And you were talking about the shoulder injury. I think it was a shoulder injury talk. And you were talking about reaching behind your shoulder and how that motion behind your shoulder was really bad for that shoulder injury. And the same thing with the freestyle, that if you were, you know, basically if you were having to come across or push through in weird directions, that that was what led to a lot of those shoulder injuries. Um, so, I mean, if you could kind of touch on some of that a little bit, that would be awesome. Cause I know I got a lot out of that. Um, yeah, those are probably I mean, 10 years apart. <laughs> what I love about what you're doing and the way you're moving your arms and kind of showing what positions, I mean, you're doing it very accurately. I think that's so important for coaches is, you know, we don't have, you don't have a whole lot of visual models that you can just easily bring up really fast on deck. So you are the model. And so what you're doing, Brian, with, you know, the way that you're have your arm position and showing that catch and what that looks like and, and as opposed to reaching deep, I think that, and, and, you know, you're not just modeling the right arm position, but where your body is too. And I think those things are so important. So yeah, what you're doing and what you're talking about is, is absolutely right. And yeah, like I definitely think it's great that the best swimming mechanics to move you forward are also the best mechanics to keep you safe and healthy for the long term. That goes for, and that goes for freestyle and backstroke. And, um, you know, I think the rotation also plays into that and where you're, where you're putting your arm and what positions you're doing. So yeah, the further back you reach, the more stress you're putting on your shoulder. And over time, it's not just swimming that leads to injuries. It's swimming with improper mechanics that often leads to injuries. And so, yeah, over time, if you keep reaching back and, and just stressing your shoulder in that way, you're going to have probably some, you're probably going to see some injuries in the long term. And I hate to bring this back to freestyle because I know we moved on, but the same goes for freestyle. If you're rotating too much and then trying to push your arm out to get that catch, that puts stress on your shoulders. And you see that on the above water recovery too. So if your arm is too narrow and just like you're reaching behind you, and that's the key backstroke freestyle anytime you reach behind the plane of your shoulders is when you're going to put stress on your shoulder and then just cause that rubbing over time that just is not that healthy so absolutely like keeping the arm to the side i love what you're saying with freestyle catch and backstroke catch being the same i mean really it is like freestyle catch is here and the real the real difference is uh, is like where your head is turned basically like in freestyle i'm facing forward and i'm looking at my hand in backstroke i'm basically just looking to the side, but it's the same thing. It's, uh, and it's, it's a weird orientation to show and to try to explain, but it really is mechanically like where you want it to be. You're trying to be in the strongest position to push water back. And that is the same for freestyle and backstroke. Just obviously with the way your body, body is oriented is different. And that, and then from there, the catch and the timing of that rotation. I mean, I, for me, that I feel like that's one of the things that's the hardest thing to teach age group kids is really timing up the rotation of their hips and their shoulders. Um, and, and I know that probably a little bit more flat than what used to be, but can you talk a little bit about how important that timing is. Yeah. So I think the most important thing is uh, when I talk about rotation, it's not so much like how much you're rotating as to when you're rotating. So in backstroke, what you're trying to do is rotate at the ends of your stroke. So at the finish and the start of your stroke is when you're rotating and it's all just kind of pops at once. You pivot at one time to get from one side to the other. And what you're using is you're using the finish to basically, like I said, you're pushing water down, like you finish a little bit downward. I wish I can't really get on my back and on my side, but as you finish, you know, you get through the catch and your hand then starts to point downward and follow through on that downward finish that will pop your hip up and get you moving to the other side and i think that is really important to use that finish to get and 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 then like help you enter and rotate onto the other side a lot of athletes the natural thing to do is to try to reach back and that's how people get the try to incorrectly get the rotation so try then 
to get people to, you know, use the finish to do that. I think what happens with the late rotation, and that's what it is. Like a late rotation is when, um, is when you're trying to rotate after your entry and trying to use that, that initial downward press, incorrect downward press to get that rotation. What happens when you rotate late is that's when your hands enter over your head. And that's when the hand, the hand enters with the back of the palm, the back of the hand too. All those things that are so easy to see to me is caused by late rotation. And, you know, and that's why like, oftentimes if you have an athlete that enters like this, if you tell them to enter exaggerated over here, it doesn't change that much because it's in, it's a rotation issue. It's not an issue of like where they're trying to put their hand. Does that, do you feel like that covers it? How would you, how, how do you explain it to your swimmers? I, I like to talk about ripping the hand out of the pocket once they get like, that's one of the things that uh, when, when Billy Dowdy was here at Mobile, we used to work on a lot was the tempo um, from your backstroke comes from the elbow bend. You can't, you can't move your hand fast if you reach too far down and you lock yourself out with this straight arm or you're not going to move fast. Um, generating the power from the elbow bend and engagement in that triangle, like you mentioned earlier. And then once they get to the bottom of their stroke, just imagine your hand being in your pocket and rip that hand up out of the pocket into, into that recovery really quick. Is, uh, and we do use pivot, um, short, tight pivot through the, through the stroke as they go in. And then we really try to think about ripping the hands out at the bottom. Yeah, we, we talk about – we well we 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 talk about the catch basically the way we you know Russell kind of described it as far as a freestyle catch that's kind of what we've changed to now and then we talk about finishing palm down and then bringing the thumb out so we talk about finishing palm down and then bringing the thumb out and I I don't even think they really bring the thumb out as much as it just gets them to think about getting their hand out of the water faster and we we try to push the hip up so we want to snap the hip up as we're finishing the palm down. Um, and then just another thing on another note, one of the things that I talk about a lot with kids is we talk about the, 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 the put a dot on your elbow, put a dot on the top of your shoulder and put a dot at your neck where you are. And you always want that dot on your shoulder to be behind the line of the dot from your elbow to your neck. So if your shoulders here, you're in a bad position. If you're here, you're in a good position. So you've got to make sure that you're keeping that shoulder behind behind that line between your neck or your ear to your elbow. Um, and that that's the number one thing when we've got a kid that's, that's hey, my shoulder's bothering me. That's the first conversation we have um, is you've got to keep – you can't end up in the chicken wing position. If you're in the chicken wing position – you're going to continue to have this problem and it's going to keep getting worse. You have to get that elbow in front of that shoulder when you're doing it, whether it's back here or whether it's up here or wherever it is. Um, and then the other thing we try to talk about is not, not having any push sideways or push back or whatever we want to be. It's more of a, an anchor and a pull. Um, so I don't know. That's just, terminology that I use. Um, I can't tell you, I've probably had that conversation uh, 10,000 times in the last 30 years. Um, so I, um, and I, I've, I've had minimal shoulder injury, so I think it's, it's working pretty well, but. Um, and then, all right, Russell, last thing I want to ask you about backstroke and then I'll let Brian, I know Brian's probably got something else to ask you, but one of the things I've seen a lot is the core and the hip position. And for me, I like to talk to my athletes about the core being basically from your chest all the way almost to the top of your knee um, and the engagement of that part of your body through uh, with the surface and, and how much someone and I'm not trying to coach my athletes to be Ryan Murphy. But if you look at Ryan's hips, um, there's just no one that keeps their hips engaged at the surface the way he does. Is that something you're seeing across the board in backstroke right now? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, body position is so key in backstroke and trying to keep your core, your torso, your core, your hips, your legs as high in the water as possible. And there is no, like, there's no, like, there's no secret way to do it other than do, you know, have a strong core through ab work and core work and then having a good kick. 
So you cannot cheat those at all. Um, you just have to be able to keep your core engaged. And uh, I think that's the thing that I see with our elite backstrokers and that I hear them talk about is, you know, at the end of a race, the, the thing that's hardest to hold is your core. And, you know, a lot of it is, you know, as you're going through a race, your core is engaged the entire time in backstroke between the position that you're in and just kind of like a little bit curled, uh, curled forward. In, and then also just as you're moving through the stroke to connect one side to the other, your core is definitely engaged the whole time. So I, I, there's no shortcuts around it. You have to have a good core and have a good kick to be a good effective backstroker and have get that body position. So tell me what you think about this. I got this from uh, Zabero. Um, I, I, so one of the things he talked about when I asked him about backstroke was he talked about keeping the shoulders opened up and rolling through the stroke. So, he, you know, it was almost like that rotation was generated through keeping the shoulders opened up rather than being in tight with the head up where you're trying to pull like this, keeping the shoulders back and using that rotation as part of that drive. Um, I thought that was an interesting way to talk about it. Um, and I guess that, that you kind of said, you know, with the head up a little bit and a little bit tighter in here. I mean, what are your thoughts? Do you think you need to be open through the shoulders or do we need to be a little bit tighter in the shoulders or does it just depend on the athlete and the strength level and the catch and all that other stuff too? Um, and then the other part of that is, is how does that affect the hip position? Yeah, that's really interesting. Cause you know, thinking of the video that I've seen of him swimming back in 88, 92, like I think 92, but it, you know, back then I feel like I could see how he's trying to do that. Um, and that's really interesting cause yeah, that captures exactly what he's doing. I think generally though, like I would say like, I like the shoulders kind of rolled forward a little bit more. I think that gives you a little bit more. What I see out of Zubero stroke and what you're talking about is like, that is definitely engaged across the body and definitely forces engagement through the core. And that's very, like, I think very obvious and evident if you do that. Um, but I think being able to also roll your shoulders forward helps you get a little bit more arm engagement too. So I, I can see trade-offs on both sides um, and, and, oh. and, a definite positive in what you're saying with that. So from an age group standpoint, age group development standpoint, I, I guess my thinking is with the shoulders opened up a little bit more and the head back just a little bit, it's going to promote a little bit better body line because I think when the shoulders come forward and the head comes up, the first thing we see is the hips drop. And then we're trying to use the kick to make up for the body position rather than the kick to be propulsive because we're in the right line. Um, and I think that also the rotation, opening the shoulders up a little bit, I feel like it's easier to get into that catch where you're in that position where your elbow is forward of the, of the shoulder. And it doesn't promote getting in back behind that, if that makes sense. Because if you're opened up, you're going to be – that shoulder is going to be back as far as you can get it. Um, so I, I guess, you know, that that's kind of my thinking and logic towards it, especially with age groupers. And then I feel like as we get better and stronger and our kick gets better, we can bring things maybe a little bit more tighter inside. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, we, I think that absolutely makes sense. Like what you're talking about makes a ton of sense for, you know, teaching from a foundational level. You know, I think the thing that I uh, caution against, and you don't, you didn't mention this, but the thing I caution against is, is hearing people talk about body position and getting high hips through arching your back. I think that probably locks your hips a little bit and probably prevents you from having this awesome kick that you can have. Um, but you didn't mention that at all, but like everything else, like, is it like, you know, having the head back, having kind of a rigid shoulder, I think, uh, all that makes sense. Cool. Well, that's good stuff. All right. Last thing real quick, about just a few minutes. Um, I'm sorry if I lose you guys, my internet, we, we just got through a hurricane down here with hurricane Sally. So we're, we got all of our power back. We're trying to get everything moving down here. But, um, during all of that, I was, I got an opportunity to watch a, a video of you talking with John T, um, about underwater dolphin kicking, um, some really great stuff in there. Um, obviously his vocabulary is probably above what all of us would want to talk about with age group kids. So, um, one or two takeaways that you got from that conversation with John T about underwater dolphin kicking. 
Yeah, I mean, Dante, his vocabulary is above so many people. I mean, me too, half the time. And I have to play catch up with it, but I think it's great. Dante's always pushing the boundaries of our knowledge in swimming and what we're, what we're capable of doing and thinking about. Uh, you know, we look at dog kicking so differently. I very much talk about from the leg mechanics and what you're trying to do with the legs. And he talks a lot about it from, I would say, using the, I don't even, like, I, this is such an abstract thing for some reason, but using the arms as levers. Yeah. And basically, I love the analogy you talked about with basically, like, everyone knows battle ropes when you're, like, using ropes for exercise and when you're trying to make, you know, whipping the rope and how it creates a wave that goes through. And basically, a good dolphin kick is like a rope. You basically shake the arm and it, it creates a wave through. And I think it's it's different from what I've heard, I would say when we first started talking about dolphin kicking, which is that you know, like you're trying to create the wave from your chest. That is not what Jonty's talking about, in my opinion. He's talking about using the arms and using that to initiate the motion that will then travel through your body, which sounds the same, um, but he talks about so spinal flexibility and um and I think that is incredibly important. He talks about uh, like the dolphin kickers that aren't good. He calls it the concord shape, which I think is hilarious because it does like the tip of a concord, the plane, uh, which doesn't isn't uh, exist anymore. So people might not know it, but the the very nose of the concord is tip is tip downward, and that's what I see with a lot of dolphin kickers that aren't that good. Is they are bent like if you're on your stomach, they're bent forward through their shoulders. And so shoulder mobility, you can call it that, but I also think it does have to do with your spinal mobility. And um, he talks about just like teaching and understanding. He calls it a wall peel where you're like leaning against the wall and like vertebrae by vertebrae, you're like taking your spine off the wall. It's, it's fascinating. He talks about dedicating one hour every week at least to just slow, deliberate dolphin kicking and how important it is and how – much impact you can make with an athlete at an age group level teaching this skill because it's so much harder to teach it and teach that kind of mobility and understanding of their body when they get to be you know college age and older so it is it was fascinating i'm curious what you got out of it and what you're going to apply with your app um yeah i got there that, that it, not going to be able to teach my athletes in the same direction. The wall peel thing. I actually thought that was pretty good. Is I think what he, the way he put it was in a streamline with your back against the wall, kind of slowly moving your heels, walking your feet out just a little bit at a time and feeling that engagement with each vertebrae all the way through. We're not going to have that conversation with the age group kids because I can just see people falling all over the place and being a complete mess. <laughs> um, but I, I really thought that I, the thing I took away from it was kind of exactly what you hit on is, those kids that try to use the front of their hands to push down on the water during that kick are the ones that just really don't go anywhere um, because they don't have leverage on the water. I liked what he said about the, the little finesse kickboard where he pushes the hands underwater so you can feel that pressure extra against there. I thought that that was a really uh, a good concept. Um, and we actually on this show hit on uh, just some different underwater stuff that, that coaches can do a few weeks back. Uh, I just think it. I love the idea of dedicating time to it weekly, but I know as an age group coach, um, an an hour for all of those uh, for for Alabama's or Indiana's or whatever pro team he's working with, a lot of those guys are really um, are really elite level and can pick it up and they're focused and engaged. Um, it's like herding cats when when you try to do it with age group kids. The longer you stand around talking, the less effective I feel like you get. So, I got um, I got one thing that I promised the boss that I would uh, I would ask. <laughs> he uh, he asked me um, what I, I know you're big on tempo, and we talked a lot about tempo with breaststroke and butterfly last time, um, and had some interesting conversation. But what what are you seeing? Is is the tempo for the hundred backstroke long course meters the same as the tempo for the hundred backstroke short course yards at NCAA's versus the Olympics? Or, you know, how, how are those comparisons short course to long course? Are we looking at a 0.1 difference, a 0.2 difference, the same? Like what 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 are we briefly? I mean, we're running out. We're out of time. But, we you know, um, just briefly, what do you what do you got on that? 
Yeah, I think short course backstroke tempo is going to be faster. I, you know, off the top of my head, I don't know the magnitude of the difference if it's 0.1 or I, I do think it's probably close to that because, I, you know, if you're talking long course backstroke tempo being in the, let's say 1.0 to 1.2 range, uh, like a slow backstroke tempo is like 1.3, 1.4 for the 100. Uh, I would say like, um, you know, sometimes you're going to get under 1.0 for uh, a 50 and 100 back, backstroke in short course. Um, you know, I think the important thing, so backstroke tempo, definitely important. I would say speed is directly correlated to that. But I do think obviously you have to do your tempo right. Like just like breaststroke, you can't just spin. Uh, I think with backstroke, the important thing is that you are rotating at that tempo. And that you're not just spinning your arms because if you're just spinning your arms and your rotation can't keep up, that's when you start reaching behind you and your and, and your strokes just won't be as effective. And then as you move through the 50 or the hundred, each stroke will get less and less effective. So, um, I, I would say like, just trying to make sure you rotate at that same tempo that you're trying to spin your arms at. All right, Brian, you got anything else? No, and I'm ready to go watch the Chiefs. There you go. <laughs> Thank you again for, for taking time out of your weekend to join us. Coaches out there, thanks for participation. I think we had as many comments in there today as we've had in a while. So, obviously, um, Russell, you know, people are here to, to listen. So, thanks for taking your time out and share that info with us. Yeah, thank you so much. I love, you know, continue to love what you guys are doing for a group swimming and swimming in general. We're trying. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys out there, everybody, y'all have a great week, uh, rest of your weekend, uh, and uh, we'll see you guys some point over the next uh, week or so, maybe next Sunday, have another couple good guests for you guys. Join us on the Swim Monkey. Swim. Swim Monkey. 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 TV. TV. On the Monkey. <laughs>